Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? What about now? Okay. Good? Okay. Can people hear me? Hello? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. I feel like I can't get this close enough to my mouth so you guys can hear it. Excellent. All right, we're going to get started. It's 2 o'clock. So if everyone wants to find a seat, that would be fantastic. Um, welcome uh, to this afternoon. Um, my name is um, Elena Andrews, and I'm the landscape staff consultant for the city of Bexley. And I want to welcome you to today's talk um, from Rooted in Bexley. And um, I am here on behalf of Mary McMunn, who sends her regards. She was not able to be here today. Um, she's out of town, but um, she's sorry. And on her behalf, I'm going to say happy Valentine's Day to everyone. It's great to see that everyone is here. And I'm wearing my heart sweater, and it's really hot. But anyway. Um, <laughs> So Rooted in Bexley is a collaborative effort between the Heritage Gardens, uh, the Bexley Bloomers, and the Bexley Tree and Public Garden Commission. I would like to thank the Bexley Public Library for hosting this event and providing all of our audiovisual needs. Thank you so much, um, Josh and Paige. And I would also like to thank Yard Barbers uh, for sponsoring this event for the second year in a row. So thank you to um, everyone for helping out with this event. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to encourage everyone to sign up for the Rick Dark event on Wednesday, March 13th here at the library at 1 p.m. That is gonna be supported by the Bexley Community Foundation. And you can find more information information on that um, on the Bexley Public uh, Library website. So today, it is with great pleasure that I introduce um, Benjamin Vogt. I will, of course, start with the fact that Benjamin received his Master's of Fine Arts from The Ohio State University. And although he currently resides in Nebraska, I believe, once a Buckeye, always a Buckeye. Benjamin also has a PhD from Nebraska in English and has taught over 50 college classes, many of which have received awards. Benjamin is the founder of Monarch, Monarch Gardens, which is a prairie-inspired design firm that specializes in lawn to meadow conversions, as well as urban shade gardens. His design work has been featured in many publications, such as Fine Gardening, Horticulture, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal, in case you recognize any of those names. He has put uh, his work, um, his PhD to good work um, in English with um, being both an award-winning writer for, the, for columns in House, the website House, as well as the author of several books, incur including A New Garden Ethic, Cultivating Defiant Compassion for Urban uh, for, un for an uncertain future, excuse me, I need my readers, it's too dark in here, even though I have, like my font is like 20 point font, um, and Prairie Up, an introduction to natural garden design. And I actually have a copy of that with us here, if anyone afterwards would like to kind of flip through that. Um, his website, monarchguard.com, is a wealth of information, and I could go on and on, but um, I'm going to stop and let Benjamin have the floor. So please welcome me in um, joining having Benjamin Boyd today. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for uh, inviting me. It's so awesome you're having Rick coming up pretty soon. You're just having all the cool people coming into Bexley. I actually lived in Bexley for one year, 21 years ago. So... However, I never made it to the library. That's really, really a shame. Uh, but yes, once a Buckeye, always a Buckeye. Guys, I'm not really a Buckeye. I'm a gopher. I'm sorry. I grew up in Minnesota. So uh, my wife is definitely a Buc Buckeye. She grew up in the Columbus area. Um, anyway, uh, do you guys know why the cookie went to the doctor? Uh, because it was feeling crummy? I'll just assume everybody is just rolling off their chairs right now. Um, but you're probably just saying, let's just get to the presentation. So if you want more puns at the end, let me know. Nobody ever asks, but if you do, I can give them to you. Um, so this presentation will run, I don't know, 50 minutes-ish. I cut it down from a much larger presentation, so I have no idea how long it's going to go. But we will certainly have Q&A time at the end, I am sure. So let's dive in. We're going to talk about gardening in the shade, specifically in urban and suburban areas where we have might have some mature trees or semi-mature trees. 
Um, I hear all the time from people, I have a shade garden. I know I can't grow anything there. So let's just talk about what I can do in the sunny area of my landscape. And that's where I sort of weep a little bit. And, you know, I suddenly blurt out, I scream, oh my God, I'm thinking of 30 plant species we could use right now in this landscape. Are you kidding? It could be stunning and gorgeous and be supporting pollinators and all these ecosystem services that we need in our urban areas, like cooling and cleaning the air and reducing stormwater runoff. Um, yeah, we can certainly have more uh, than, than uh, wood mulch and dead lawn and shade areas. So let's get into it. We are going to cover a lot today, and I'm sure a lot of this is going to be, there's, there's going to be a lot of new stuff thrown at you, too, especially if you're used to what I would call traditional gardening, even even though traditional gardening has only been around about seven, 70 years, uh, you know, uh, beds with a lot of wood mulch, plants spread far apart, um, thin foundation beds. Uh, so we're going to be looking at natural garden design today. How can we create a, a shade meadow? that covers the ground and gives us all the ecosystem services we, we want. So think sort of like a shade meadow. Um, we all know sun metals and all the flowers, but we can do a lot of that same stuff in the shade. So we're gonna look at shade gardening 101, prep and management, and then we're gonna go through a lot of the plants. Uh, if you're listening to me live and you have a cell phone, once we get to the plant screens, you can just take a picture of the plant list and go home and do research to see if those plants will work in your site conditions, uh, site conditions, the soil, the moisture levels, all that good stuff. So let's get going, shall we? We are going to say goodbye today to tired, overused, homogenized, exotic plant species that don't support local wildlife or celebrate regional history, regional natural history, right? The plants that are native to your ecoregion. So today, this. Hopefully this doesn't upset anybody, but our goal here today is to say goodbye to Astilbe, Brunera, Hosta, Palmineria, Heuchera, Hellebores, Galanthus, all that stuff, okay? We are going to be gardening locally for the local east ecosystem and the local wildlife because there are just so many. There's just such a huge, ridiculous number of native plants we can use, and it's, it's a shame they're not all sold at the big box stores like all of these exotic plants um, often are, but I will give you some tips on where you can find some of those. I know Ohio is rich in native plant nurseries. You have a lot there between, well, should I mention Cleveland and Cincinnati? Um, I know Columbus is always stuck between the two. I don't want to get into too much trouble today. I already said I was a gopher. Uh, so real quickly, I'm sure a lot of you know some of this already here, native plants, the benefits of native plants. They provide 15 to 35 times the caterpillar bio biomass versus exotic plants. And by biomass, we just means, you know, basically how much, how much weight per pound of, of caterpillars, uh, larva from, from butterfly larva to uh, bug larva, insect larva, all, you know, all all those different species because that's bird food 96 something like 96 percent of songbirds feed just insects uh, to their babies in the nest over that roughly two-week period um, after the babies hatch uh, and then fly out of the nest and anyway, they're not they're not being fed bird seed they're not being fed hosta they're not being fed wood mulch it is a high protein diet uh, of whatever mama and daddy can, can, can forage for them our native plants support our 3,500 plus native bee species. And our native bee species have longer flight times than exotic honeybees. And they provide specific pollination like buzz, which uh, bumblebees are great at, which increases, which increases fruit yield quality and shelf life of, of, of um, things like blueberries and almonds and strawberries in the grocery stores, but also is going to increase pollination effectiveness uh, of, of our wildflowers and native plants uh, across the ecoregion that we, whatever ecoregion we find ourselves in. Native plants are adapted to local regional climates. Their blooms are in sync with all the emerging insects, especially those um, that need support, specialist insects that require specific leaves or specific pollens from, from specific plant species or family or, or genera to feed their young. We all know monarch butterflies, right? They have to have milkweed. That's where their eggs are laid. That's what the caterpillars eat. Uh, you know, this is repeated hundreds and thousands of times across, across the insect and bug world. And even a lot of our native Native bees are specialists, uh, where they are just focusing on the pollen from one species or, or, or one family of plants. They time their emergence for when those plants are blooming to get that pollen to feed their young because that's what they evolved with. And if those native plants aren't there, you're out of luck. And then we have this entire pollinator system going out of whack and plants aren't being pollinated efficiently and all that terrible stuff. So that's a crash course on the benefits. 
Because this is who we're gardening for, right? We're not just gardening for ourselves. We are gardening for the larger ecosystem, for other species, many species who find themselves, um, you know, <laughs> on the cusp population-wise, especially in urban areas. The great thing about urban areas and suburban areas is there's actually a lot of really good for flower diversity, especially compared to rural areas anymore, which tend to be more monocultures, you know, from road to road. It's just one plant type. Uh, so our urban and suburban areas have a lot of power and can do a lot of good and have a lot of benefit for species because of all the gardens and, and planting areas that we have and a lot of good plant diversity as well from, from trees and shrubs to flowers and grasses and sedges and whatnot. The benefits of shade gardens, yes, they do exist. <laughs> Less weed pressure for sure. I see it time and again. Many weed seeds need full sunlight to germinate. They need sunlight touching the soil, touching the seed, warming that soil up and getting that seed to grow. And it's a lot harder for a lot of weeds uh, to get going, especially annual weeds that we tend to have a lot of issues with when we're starting a brand new garden, you know, crabgrass, foxtail, things like that. Creeping Charlie is another story. I'll mention that later on. Uh, shade gardens have moderated temperatures, right, which is going to improve establishment for plants. They're not going to get heat stressed when they're then in that crucial first couple of weeks after being planted. They won't have to be watered as much. Theoretically, hopefully, kind of depends on your soil type, how well drained it is. Um, shade reduces all those temperature and soil temperature extremes, and it's certainly easier for us to garden in the shade. Uh, I cannot wait to have a shade garden someday. I'm working on it. My my oak trees are slowly growing and and. Maybe the next homeowner will be able to have the shade that, that I covet so I can try a bunch of new plant species here at headquarters. There's not that much you do differently aesthetically compared to a full sun meadow garden space. You're still using natural plant communities, still layering uh, like, like, like you would see in the, in the wild plant communities. We're gonna talk about that in a second. You're still planting densely every 12 inches apart. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Uh, using something called matrix uh, garden design. So we're trying to emulate nature uh, to cover the ground as quickly as possible and use something called green mulch, which is plants. No more wood mulch. If you're going to use wood mulch, just apply that at the installation, you know, at the installation stage, one inch, two inches, and then never mulch again. Let the plants take over, self-sow, spread, fill in, and, and do all that work for you. Shade models now do tend in general, in my experience, because of the plants that we're using that are adapted to shade, they tend to be shorter than, the, than, than, than sun meadows, sun plants, and have less consistent bloom time over the entire growing season, relying instead on a lot of, a lot of texture and form uh, in the landscape to, to give us that sort of wow you know, uh, effect in the, in the garden. So here's what I mean by layers and density. Um, this this is how our planting needs to change, especially if we're planting for wildlife and multiple ecosystem services and thinking about climate resilience. Uh, we have a ground cover layer, uh, which tends to be, this is definitely our main component of a living green mulch, tends to be bunch grasses uh, or sedge, something like that. So something grassy and then emerging from that, we have masses and drifts of different flowers that are blooming from spring through fall. So we have that nice bloom succession. So we always have something in flower throughout the entire growing season to support adult insect and bugs, bug species who are coming uh, for nectar or pollen. And then finally, the third layer, the structural layer is taller herbaceous perennial species like Joe Pieweed there, and then shrubs of various sizes and trees of various sizes. We'll have the least number of those. So in this, in this layered, dense, lush, natural sort of a, a garden ecosystem, most of our plants are gonna be in the ground cover layer. That's our green mulch. That's what's going to be uh, suppressing weeds and keeping things cool and improving soil moisture and amending soil naturally and breaking apart clay soil naturally. This is a matrix. So if you're not familiar with matrix design, I've written a lot of articles on it. You can Google it. You can go to my website and, and, and do the search bar there. You can take my online class on matrix garden design if you want to go really, really deep. So all those green little dots are every uh, are a sedge or a grass planted every 12 inches. Remember, that's our living green mulch. That's what's going to replace uh, wood mulch. And we're using a shade garden today. So species we can use are any of those carrot species. A lot of those are primarily going to be used in dry soil, medium moisture soil conditions from clay all the way to loam. Again, it's important to research your species and certainly to research them based on Latin or scientific plant name. I, I know that's very intimidating for a lot of people. It definitely used to be for me. But when you search by common name, that could be bringing up a plant that actually isn't the one you're searching for because common names vary regionally, um, even by person 
even between people. So um, always research by Latin plant name. Don't worry if you can't pronounce it. Nobody can. Just be able to spell it, copy paste it in the Google search bar. Okay, that's our matrix. That's our main ground cover, right? And then in this, we're going to do our masses and drifts of different forb species, different flower species. So here's just here's just an example of what it looks like. It doesn't matter what's in here right now. I just want to show you what the plan looks like. Okay, this gives us our layers. We have two layers here: the low sedge ground cover layer, and then we have that seasonal theme layer. Okay, we have flowers blooming at different times of year, like the phallic drum and the uh, uh, aquilegia. I can never pronounce that right. Red columbine. Those are blooming in the spring. Solidago. That's going to be blooming late summer, uh, early fall. And this is sort of what that looks like. Actually, this is very much what it looks like. Uh, you are looking at a matrix ground cover of Carex albicans and Carex pennsylvanica uh, with masses and drifts of different forb species. Uh, woodland gardens tend to really be their showiest at the spring, but I'm sort of trying to fight against that. Uh, we have a lot of ephemeral species, species that just bloom uh, primarily in the springtime. Um, uh, most often used in gardens and i'm tr i know i'm just Ryan. i'm trying to think whoa what's going to be in summer i'm going to show you that stuff a little bit later on because we want to have flowers a whole year long but this is where texture and, and contrast and shape come into play so shady areas in landscapes especially urban landscapes are often already uh partially prepped right there's dead lawn with exposed soil tree roots are poking up mulch beds that are devoid of plants there's areas of erosion because there's nothing covering the ground. We don't want that. Or there's hostamania, which is sort of like already a bed that's prepped sort of out of frustration because it's just like, well, nothing else grows there, but hosta grows anywhere. So I'll just put that there to have something green. So here, here, here's an example of a, of, a, of a shade garden, right? There's lots of gaps in here. What can we do here? Certainly bring in the matrix, the, the carrots, the sedge species, bring them in here to give us that living green mulch. And as always, more forbs, more flowers, spring, summer, and fall. There's lots of gaps here, lots of opportunity in this bed. Here, this landscape, I mean, it's dead lawn underneath a tree. It's, uh, it's pretty... It's pretty obvious that lawn's not going to work here. So what are you going to do? Do you really just want to have bare soil? Probably not. Um, certainly don't, don't want to waste water on that spot. So let's get in a shade garden and, and uh, help out some pollinators at the same time, right? Uh, here's a shade, partial shade garden, and it's just mulched. Nothing is growing here. Um, but we can get a lot of things to grow here. It's a, I love this blank slate stuff. My imagination just runs wild with me when I see these, these kind of landscapes. So much we can do. Here's a rural acreage site. Uh, this, this was a seeding project. So uh, we'll see how that looks in a couple of years. Seeding projects take about five years to really get going. But a lot of opportunity in this space as well. Full sun just right off to the right. So interesting um, combination of plant species we used. Sometimes we have landscapes that look like this, right? A lot of tree roots on the surface. The top soil, the soil in general has started to wash away because nothing's covering the ground because it's such a shady spot. People sometimes ask me, well, when you have a landscape like this, do you just come in and put down a bunch of topsoil or compost to cover those roots and then plant into it? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. Because if I covered these roots with soil, I wouldn't be able to see what I was planting into. So we'd come in with our augers, our machines, and we'd be just drilling right into tree roots. So there is a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of soil here, a lot of open spaces to put plants in. Um, woodland plant species that are going to self-sow, uh, spread by root runners over the next couple of years, and fill in all the little soil gaps where we can't drill into because they are here among those roots. Uh, but the plants will figure it out. They will cover the ground if you get the right plants in the right place, right? Here's another landscape that, again, you know, let's go further. We don't just have to settle for a monoculture or near monoculture of hosta, where the only thing using those plants is a queen bumblebee uh, during the bloom period, the couple days bloom period in May. Let's, let's support more insect species, more fauna, more bugs uh, throughout the entire growing season and, and up that aesthetic contrast and interest in the woodland garden. Now, there are several ways to prep landscapes if you need to prep the landscape. And this is specifically thinking about spots that are in lawn or half lawn, something like that. And whichever method you choose is up to you. Um, it will be informed by the ideology, physical labor, how much money you have to spend. 
Um, this might be a screen you could you pull out your your cell phone for and take a picture of or read the uh, article free article on my website because I won't cover it too much. You can sheet mulch. You can put down cardboard or newspaper or something. Um, the bene the drawback of that is that it reduces air and water transfer between the soil and the atmosphere. You can solarize with plastic, uh, but that takes an entire growing season to do effectively. And then you have all the microplastics going in into the environment. I'm just so not into plastic right now. You could rent a sod cutter, but you got to have really good upper body strength, right? Uh, you can also do a spray kill, which is uh, cheap uh, and you know cost effective, and usually just need one application, and it won't be going into the soil when you're doing that. It's not like you're a corn field or soybean field you're spraying over and over and over for decades and decades and decades, but your method you 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 choose and you know it's going to be dependent on what kind of weed pressure or plant pressure whatever you have on your site as well as a bunch of other things so and then there are sites and i've had a couple of these where they are just infested with something like a creeping charlie i bet a couple of you have this and boy is that hard to get rid of um, the only thing that i have found that works is going nuclear on it actually i haven't actually gone nuclear nuclear but it would probably be a good idea. Probably just supercharge it, right? Uh, mechanical and hand removal. I mean, if you leave a little bit of creeping Charlie vine behind, it just roots down and spreads like the Dickens, right? Multiple herbicide treatments, solarizing. We've tried doing each of these. We try, tried doing them together. Really, the only thing that I think works is um, try to hit it hard uh, at the beginning to reduce the number of plant species and then pick out the plants over years. I have one client who's really anal retentive picking out uh, Creeping Charlie and it's done a great job and it just hasn't come back. Uh, but also having plants that outcompete and shade it. So that means you're choosing native plant species that are aggressive. They self-sow a lot. Um, they spread by runners, runners and they get taller than the Creeping Charlie and shade it out. But even that is 100%. That's not 100% guarantee. But before you prep a site, you need to make sure you get rid of aggressive, um, non-native, or even native weed species, okay? Because otherwise, you're just going to have to start over, and you've wasted all of your money. So the cleaner your site is before you start planting a native plant meadow, the better. Here is a, sorry this picture is blurry. It's the best one I have. This is a client's backyard. It was like 3,000 square feet of nothing but hosta. Um, yes, it's green, it's covered uh, during the growing season, but once those plants die in the winter, uh, the foliage desiccates, you're left with bare soil, and we just had soil streaming off of this backyard into the neighbor's backyard because it wasn't covered um, basically fall, winter, and, and half of spring or most of spring. Uh, clients wanted to do something more sustainable and obviously to support more pollinators. Uh, we, God, it was so hard. You cannot, you cannot dig up by hand thousands of hosta. Okay, the the, the cost would just be <laughs> ginormous, right? Uh, so we did a lot of weed whacking. Actually, the clients did a great job of doing this for me. Weed whacking, um, doing some chemicals, just targeted chemical treatments on the stems after you cut them back, and that seemed to do a really good job. But we still haven't gotten rid of all of them two years later but we have a good native plant bed going. I'll show you a picture of that later on. So when you're installing shade meadows, start out with an inch or two of wood mulch just to keep the soil uh, moisture up a little bit, add a little bit of organic matter. Don't amend the soil on your site unless you know it's been like poisoned with oil or something like that. Match the plants to the site. Don't change the site to match the plants. So that means researching your plant species. You have dry clay, use plant species that like dry clay. You have moist loam, use species that like moist loam, where that's what they evolved in in the wild. We're going to use our sedge matrix in this site, plants every 12 inches, and then we're perennials and ephemerals in, in masses and drifts. And let's... You know, more and more plugs are becoming available uh, to folks, and there's... And, Plugs are basically young baby plants and they're incredibly cost effective. You can get a tray of 32 or a tray of 50 for roughly a hundred, $125, okay? You go to a, a nursery and you get a gallon pot, it's what, 15, 20, sometimes $25. 
So, I mean, just, just pull out your calculator right now and, and do the math. Uh, using plugs is much more affordable. These smaller plants establish a lot more quickly um, because their roots are touting, touching the, the, the native soil on site uh, a lot sooner. There's not anywhere near as much transplant shock like there is in a one gallon container. If you're looking for plugs, you guys are, are and, and you want it mail order delivered by UPS or whatever <laughs> to your door, uh, look at Azel native plants, I-Z-E-L. They are uh, a middleman that works with native plant wholesalers uh, across the uh, central and eastern United States. So wholesalers that used to just sell to pros like me, uh, now everybody can take advantage of buying these, these plug trays of 32 or 50. And they're so much easier to dig in the ground, especially if you have clay soil. Uh, you know, you, you're, not, you're not spending 10 minutes trying to dig a, a perfect hole for a one gallon plant. I used to do that, and I wanted to give up. Uh, give up after doing one plant. Uh, plugs are, are so much more, more fun, especially if you have a drill and you just go and do that a couple hundred times. Management of these uh, shade meadow gardens is similar to all types of sun gardens, um, but if you have a sedge matrix, you may never actually need to cut it down because sedge doesn't actually need to get cut down, and you're going to be using sedge if you have a shade garden. That's going to be your base. Uh, green living green mulch, yeah, your wood mulch replacement. That's just what it's going to be. Maybe you do cut down some spent flower stalks here and there to tidy up in spring a little bit after soil temperatures reach 50 degrees, not air temperatures. It's soil temperatures. So ignore all the memes you see on social media about air temperatures hitting 50 degrees. That is not when you cut down and clean up. It is soil temps at 50 degrees. Oof, speech over. <laughs> Um, but most of the shade gardens I manage for clients, uh, we're just letting them do their thing in the spring. Sedge greens up pretty early. Um, it's usually greening up and growing before we even ever get to it. And I don't want to cut it and, and, and harm it after it starts growing and, and, and knock it back. So here's an example. So this is, um, um, uh, well out here in Nebraska, this would probably be what April ish, mid April ish, perhaps. Um, so the sedge is green up. You still see the brown front left over from last season, but in another week or two, that will all be covered up by green new growth. I'm going to show you some installation pictures. Um, just a foundation bed around a home here. You can see those sedge plugs getting laid out. Here's one just after installation. Uh, the lawn was killed, and we planted straight straight into it and then put down wood mulch. Um, I quickly learned after this project that it's much easier to put down the wood mulch first and then put the plugs in the ground. Here is that garden a year later. I think this is Carex rosea or Carex radiata. Um, very pretty clump forming, mound forming sedge that gets about 12 inches tall. We're going to look at all, a bunch of these species here in 10 minutes or so. Here is that garden two years later. Uh, the perennial forbs, the flowers are starting to grow up. There's some goldenrod in there. I see some columbine. Uh, early meadow rue. Client requested that we leave a few hosta in there, which I'm glad they did because it's a nice textural uh, contrast with those thick glossy leaves compared to the fine textured leaves of the sedge uh, matrix that we have planted around it. Uh, but there's a lot of texture. We did some, um, I can't remember common names anymore, Solomon seal, uh, polygonatum biflorum in there too. That has thicker leaves like hosta, so that contrasts nicely with the sedge as well. Here's another angle of that landscape. So lawn wasn't growing very well for them. So we did the sedge meadow and it's doing way, way better, right? Way more thick, way more lush. Even the male person likes it, so that's a plus. Here is that landscape I showed you before. They had a lot of hosta in the backyard, hundreds if not thousands of hosta. This is right after installation. The wood mulch was down, and then we and then we came in and did all of our plugs. Something like 2,500, 3,000 plants went into this landscape, so it is about every every square foot we have a plant. Another angle for you. I know it's not very sexy, but it was a lot of work. It's getting sexy. Uh, another client's uh, little little sedge bed here using Carex albicans white tinge sedge is one of the common names. This is under a clump river birch tree. We should all stop planting clump river birches because they don't live very long and they blow over and snap with just like somebody breathing on them. So those are over planted trees. But uh, we have the shade here now. So we did the sedge matrix and, and forbs for shade in there. 
just planted underneath um, some mature oaks and other trees here. And this is a landscape where we have a mature oak tree that gives us shade in the afternoon, but not the morning. So a little trickier. Um, so where we're getting some hot sun until about lunchtime, decided to throw in, throw in some um, uh, woodland edge species like uh, purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, put in some asters as well, where there's some more of that sun. But for the most part, morning sun has less extreme UV radiation than afternoon sun. Um, so even putting shade plants on the east uh, facing building is going to be totally cool. Um, they're gonna be fine with that. You wouldn't wanna put them on the west side. And when you have, where you have mature plantings already, uh, look at these uh, miscanthus grasses, a non-native grass I wouldn't recommend planting because it's starting to spread in a lot of places. But uh, in this garden bed here, there was a lot of, a lot of grass, a, a lot of the miscanthus, and then we had wood chips around it, wood mulch around it, no plants. Okay, so we just had clumps, you know, every couple feet apart of tall grasses. Well, put in some shade plants or part shade plants around those taller grasses and fill it in, build the layers, make it more sustainable, increase those ecosystem functions uh, that we want to have in a more natural landscape that benefits the environment. Now, if you have a birch tree, any kind of birch tree, they especially benefit, well, all, all trees do, from having a thick ground cover within the drip line, so above their roots. I hear that question sometimes too. Aren't you harming tree roots or stealing resources from trees if you're planting above their root zones? No, where, where did, whoa. Where do we see a lot of trees in the forest? What's growing on the forest floor? Well, if it's a healthy forest floor, it's a lot of sedge. It's a lot of herbaceous perennials. It's a lot of ephemerals. There's a lot of diversity down there. Um, it's not just it's not just wood mulch. Uh, trees trees love to have plants underneath them, and especially birch trees. Cool on the soil, you know, keeping it more moist. Uh, who wouldn't like that? Here's an example, right? Uh, Carex blanda, that's a thicker leaved sedge in there with some geraniums and um, some weedy tree seedlings in there that need to get taken care of. I think I even put some hookera in here, um, a native hookera species, because uh, it likes part shade and the shade is sort of dappled underneath this particular birch tree. While columbine is in there, you see that wild geranium blooming as well. This is just a very small bed, you know, 50 square feet or something. Uh, way better looking than wood mulch. Hopefully you agree with me on that. If you don't, that's really scary. Let's talk about soft, soft landings really quickly. Uh, many keystone plants, which support a larger diversity of insect larvae, um, include trees such as oaks, elms, cherries, and willows. If you're a follower of Doug Ptolemy, you've probably heard about this. A natural ground layer underneath these trees is going to provide places for larvae or caterpillars to complete their life cycle. That means pupate. So they turn to a chrysalis um, or cocoon and, and, and you know, do their thing. Uh, versus a lawn, there's no soft landing in a lawn or a, a bed of mulch. There's no place to hide, to shelter, to turn into a butterfly or a moth. That's a hard landing. It's not a soft landing. Soft landings also provide host plants for even more larva caterpillars as well as pollen and nectar for adult bees moths butterflies wasps etc all these wonderful insects and bugs that literally make our world run again you know if you go to a healthy forest it's not wood mulch on the floor it's it's these soft landings it's a diverse native plant community something like this this is gorgeous isn't it it's a lot a lot of urban uh Areas around well, any any urban area, any city in our country, we're driving around now. You know, instead of lawn, let's. Why don't we have this, right? Or this? There's some may apple there in the front too. So many, so many plants you can use. Packer aurea is in there. Golden ground cell. Here's an east-facing garden with Carex albicans and a native out here to us, at least, called Hucra richardsonia. And it might, it might poke over in Ohio. I don't know. You'll have to look that up on the USDA uh, plant map website. But see that nice contrast there? The Hucra leaves are big and thick. The sedge leaves are, are thin and narrow. So there's a lot of aesthetic, cool aesthetic things you can do, even when you're using 100% native plants, which is something I always challenge myself to do. Love it. 
This bed uh, got a little flat with a rainstorm, but Carex albicans, Carex pennsylvanica, there's Solidago flexicollis, and there is the uh, zigzag goldenrod. That's the uh, thicker leaf plant on the right and then back behind the bench. Then we have Aruncus, which is what? What's one of the common names? The, 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 the goat's beard, right? You can see Echinacea purpurea in there because it's a, it, it's a woodland edge. So this place gets a little bit of sun. So it does OK there. Uh, matrix here of Carex rosea with early meadow root, Thalactrum dioicum. Don't worry, plant lists are coming for which your cell phones will be swung out emphatically. Here's a west side, a uh, client's west side that we did two years ago. Um, so basically you're looking south and to the left is the house and to the right is a sidewalk with a lot of tall mature trees. Uh, so it's only getting direct overhead sun for maybe two hours in the middle of the day. So think 12 o'clock, one o'clock in summer and then the tall trees around it give it shade. So I did some of those woodland edge sun species in here. There's Echinacea purpurea again. That blue you see up there on the left is something called Conoclinium cholestinum, blue mist flower, uh, planted by a downspout because it likes it more moist. Uh, but then we have the, the, the sedge matrix. So two hours of direct overhead sun is just enough not to fry the space and, and keep all the plants happy. This is what that space looked like before planting. In lawn with spray killed and we plant directly into it after putting the wood mulch down wood mulch first and then plants there i am laying out the plant species i do i do 99 percent of my gardens as far as design on site so i'm a very plein air sort of artiste if you will uh, every time I do a plan, it's it's wasted hours and days and weeks because I get to the, out to the site and I'm like, no, 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 this mass of this this group of plants would look better over here or do better over here. So I just do it on site and feel the sight lines and, and feel the textures and the flow of the landscape. And that works well for me. Probably a speech you didn't need to hear. Uh, here's that landscape uh, a year later. Very busy sidewalk, incredibly busy. Benjamin, uh, I hate to interrupt, but we are still stuck on the slide that has the west side for only two hours. Okay, that's that must be. We're all right. Well, it's working on my computer. Okay, would you mind would you mind unsharing your screen and then resharing it and see if that might reboot it? All right, I'll try and see if that works. Thank you. So what do you see now, the PowerPoint? Uh, we still see the PowerPoint, um, it, but it's still the image of the two hours and it's saying the video is paused due to problems with your network. All right, there's stop sharing. Now we see hey, you. Hey, there's everybody in the audience. Hey, everybody, woo! Oh, you guys are all so, oh, you're so hot. Look at that. <laughs> okay, now I need to share it again, right? You want me to? Now you're frozen. <laughs> this is because I said I was a Gophers fan. All right, you seem to be back now. All right, I'm gonna try sharing again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we see the PowerPoint, but it still is just the same image as before. It's not moving for you at all? No. Mm, that's frustrating. Uh, I used to work at a blanket factory, but it folded. Nobody's laughing. This is not good. I don't hear any laughter. While they're figuring out the tech issues, I have no choice but to give you all puns. All right. It might just be the internet on your end. Uh, that's highly unlikely. Okay. 
Benjamin, do we want to just do maybe if there are a couple of audience questions while we're trying to get the PowerPoint to internet. work? Yeah, internet looks good here, guys. And I've never, ever right. had an issue. If I could ask everyone to be quiet so we can hear Benjamin, I think what we might try to do, if there are any audience questions, while we see if the satellite can swing back around and see if the internet starts working again, that's usually what I always think is the problem. <laughs> So are there any questions? Okay, I'm gonna actually walk with, I'm gonna back here. If you can see, if you could talk like as close as you can to the microphone as possible so the people who are online can hear. I know it's awkward. My big question is about interaction with the local wildlife. What about the interaction with the local wildlife? <laughs> Are they going to eat all my newly planted plants, or is this native plants going to be much more animal resistant, which I'm hoping? What do you mean by animal resistant? What species? Deer. Deer and rabbits. We were going to get. We were going to get to that. If if we ever if we ever get back to the presentation, we were going to get to that. Um, well, this is good. I can just give the presentation orally. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Number one, we want our plants eating eaten. Um, to a certain degree, right? That's the whole reason of using native plants. Uh, we specifically want to see holes in our leaves. That means we have leaf cutter bees coming to uh, get material to line their nests. Uh, we have caterpillars eating the leaves so they can turn into butterflies and flowers for us. Uh, deer and rabbits, yeah, deer and rabbit pressure is a very controversial topic because I think deer and rabbit pressure depends a lot on what's available at that time of year, how large the herd population is. The fact that we had, uh, so we have this trophic uh, cascade effect that is not working, is not balanced. We have created a totally unbalanced ecosystem uh, that, that deer thrive in. Uh, now that I'm done with my little mini polemic there, uh, sedge species are pretty much herbivore resistant. Deer and rabbits don't like to eat sedge. They don't like to eat grasses. There's so much more stuff they'd rather eat. So these sedges, when you're using a sedge matrix where you're having a sedge planted every 12 inches and then planting the flower masses and drifts among that sedge matrix, the sedge acts like a bodyguard, okay? So deer and rabbits will come to that and be like, oh, I don't like this plant. I'm going to move along. I'm not going to you know, mess with this site anymore, even though there probably is stuff they like to eat. Now, this is not 100% foolproof. You can also use forb species whose leaves are aromatic and minty. And I was going to talk about some of those later. Uh, leaves that, have, that are fuzzy, um, that tends to reduce chances of having herbivore damage on them. But even the word damage is problematic, right? Um, nature's got to eat. Uh, uh, but, but there are certainly larger issues at play here. So that's my uh, mini uh, rabbit and deer lecture for the day. Benjamin, we were actually wondering if you might actually log off and then log back on um, and see if maybe that might reboot the system. All right, guys, I will try and come back and I'll bring candy when I come back. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about all this, yes? I will when he comes back, yes. Okay. Nobody left it. You can hear me. We are here. We can see you. <laughs> uh, and you're moving. I'm moving. Yep. I wish I was moving. <laughs> All right. Can you see that? Yep, we can still, it's still the same slide that is the west side, but only two hours. Can you nope, see that? it moved. Yay. Right. Okay. Oh, what was I talking about? Um, killed, killed this lawn, whatever, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we're back on track. Thank you everyone for All your right, patience. We're back on track. Well, that was exciting. That's never ever happened to me before. Ah, well, that's going in the diary today. All right. Put the mulch down, laying out the plugs. I design on site. Uh, there it is a year later. Okay, yeah, all right, here we are. All right, so it's important to blend ephemerals. Now, ephemerals are species that are just gonna come up and do their thing in the spring, maybe early summer, and then they die back, right? 
Um, and perennials are hopefully going to stay around for a long time. Some perennials are only there a couple of years. Some perennials are there for decades. We're mixing all this stuff well together. So as one plant plant species fades out, either during that growing season, like an ephemeral, or five years down the road, like one perennial species, uh, we have other species that are waiting in the wings to take over and fill in the gaps. And the wonderful thing about sedge is that they, you know, they green up early and come up early, even before some lawns in the spring. And then they, you know, sometimes they go a little eh in the middle of summer. They're still green, but they're not, you know, quite as cool looking. But they, they regrow and regreen again in the fall and late summer. Uh, you don't see that with very many, uh, very many plant species. So a long time ago, I had this matrix slide up uh, for you where I said every green dot was a sedge 12 inches apart. All the colorful circles are uh, uh, herbaceous perennial species like solidagos and wild columbines and, and, and uh, Solomon seal. And then, you know, well, I was just feeling exuberant one day and decided to put in a drift of Virginia bluebells in the middle. So that way you have some even more color, even earlier cover color and resources for pollinators in the spring. So drift them in there, right? And hopefully they'll slowly spread around as well. For example, there's a shot. We didn't, it's, it, <laughs> the, the PowerPoint is in our front today. Um, it is now stuck okay, on what? this slide that says plants. Mm. Oh, no, okay, Buckles. moved. All right. Okay, so where do you, what do you see now? We the see matrix the plant? drift of um, the Virginia bluebells okay. in the sedge matrix. All right. And now you see an image of a garden? Nope. Okay. Well, maybe if we t wait 10 minutes, it'll come up. Right? <laughs> so while we're waiting, could you, um, oh, hey, it moved. It, yeah, so oh, there's like a ridiculous. one minute delay. Okay, I was gonna talk about herbivore tolerance. We already did that. Um, now it says right. nothing grows me. in shade. All right, well, what, well, tell me when you see a bunch of Latin. Okay, we saw a list now. <laughs> wow, that is some delay. It must be because I'm actually coming to you today uh, from China. Um, okay, so anyway, if you want to take a picture of this screen, do it without those cell phones. Uh, this is just a partial list of perennial and ephemeral uh, native plant species that grow in shade. Some will do it dry, some will do it wet, some, some are great in clay, some would rather have uh, a rich loamy soil. Um, there's a female uh, Thalactrum dioecum early meadow rue on there, right? One of the species where the females flowers look very different uh, than the males flowers, but you never know what plant you're buying um, at the nursery or from the plug wholesaler. So you guys probably have plenty of time to picture, take a picture of that while I go to the next screen. Just let me know again when it switches over. I will. I could hum the Jeopardy so theme song. Oh my God. Huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having a brain fog moment thinking about other puns as well. So as we potentially wait for this um, to, to move, could you mention squirrels? And we have a lot of squirrels in Bexley and in Columbus digging up small plug plants. Mm -hmm. Oh, now we have a new screen that says ephemerals are queen bumblebee buffets. Yeah, so you know the queen butterfly, uh, bumblebees, uh, the gynes that they're called, they come out in the spring and they love to go off for ephemerals, right? Uh, this will help increase uh, bloom diversity, uh, pollen uh, pollen diversity for those queen butterfly uh, butterflies. I keep saying that queen bumblebees starting their nests every spring because that's how the life cycle works, right? Uh, and our bumblebees, they evolved in a cooler climate, so um, they need as many resources as they can possibly get so that they can uh, adapt in this changing, warming, messier climate where if you live in Nebraska, it's dry all the time. If you live in Ohio, you probably have lots of rain. I don't know. I always think of Ohio as greener and lusher. So eventually there's going to be another screen that will show you a list of part sun, perennials, grasses, and sedges that you can take a picture of as well. 
And again, those are going to be species for a range of soil conditions. Um, some of them you'll even recognize, I am sure. So any thoughts on squirrels? You know, we have more issues with, with raccoons. You know, once those plugs root out and establish, a squirrel's going to have a really hard time pulling things up. And I bet you're seeing more square di squirrel damage in the fall, aren't you, than the spring? So when they're looking for resources to uh, squirrel away for winter, um, there is nothing you can do but go out there and put the plug back in the ground and wait for it to root out next year. Some people are saying a lot of it is in the summer that okay. the squirrels can get kind of aggressive. Yeah. Oh, God, I remember when I was on the Ohio State campus one day sitting on a bench eating my lunch, I was having nuts, squirt, you know, acorns thrown at me. They were absolutely, literally, I have never seen such aggressive squirrels in my life except for the Ohio State campus. I had to get up and move. I couldn't eat anymore. Just... <laughs> That's how we breed them in Ohio. So we I now is, have right? um, part sun perennials, a flower list. All right, take your pictures of that. That is a really, really long delay. And I, I just can't believe that would be my internet because it's always so good and I've never had this issue. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the next screen because it's gonna take 60 seconds. Right. We'll have to uh, curtail this presentation a little bit because people will have to leave, I'm sure. All right. It switched to understory. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Understory and wedge woody, uh, edge woody. So we're talking shrubs. Okay. Take a quick picture because now that we have a good internet connection for a couple of minutes, we should go fast. You'll, you'll recognize a lot of these too, I'm sure, guys. Uh, like there's pussy willow there on the left, maple, red maple on the right. Do you see that screen? Not yet. Oh, darn it. <laughs> oh, yep. All right. Well, that's better than before. So, uh, you know, a lot of these woody plants are providing pollen resources for, for native bees that emerge early in the season because not all the bees come out. Bam. It's not like five o'clock and everybody comes out, right? We have different species emerging at different times of year. And our early season pollinators will just go bananas over these early season uh, blooming woody plants. So it's not just flowers that are blooming, it's trees as well. And what grows under a pine tree? Everything that we are talking about today. That's a question that gets asked of me a lot. Do you have to remove the pine needles? Nope. Uh, put down a bunch of Carex pennsylvanica, put down a bunch of the, the uh, flowers of Forbes we're talking about today. You're gonna be good to go. We when do. you see three set, do, th do you see three sedge? Not yet. It still says what yeah. grows under a pine tree. Okay. It's nice talking with you today and getting to know you. Yeah, you you too. <laughs> this is great. Uh, what, what, what's your favorite food? Uh, boy, squirrel. <laughs> squirrel? <laughs> Guys, come on. I guess you could eat squirrel. I've heard they're high in cholesterol, though. How about you? What's your favorite food? Uh, whatever my son says he's going to be able to, that, that he'll eat for dinner. All right, now you know, we guys, see guys three, five. All right. three versions of Carex. Yep, there's Carex albicans on the left. That is a, a fine textured, thin leaved uh, ground cover that's about 12 inches wide. It's a nice clump forming, doesn't really spread very much by seed or runners or anything. I love to use it, even works in a lot of full sun applications if it's getting a little bit of moisture. One of the most adaptable sedge species in our country and a very wide range too, I think for a uh, native range. Eric Springalia is a little bit taller. It gets about 18 inches tall, um, has a little different shape to it, more upright, and then sort of arching over once it gets older. And then Carex blanda is a very uh, a, a much shorter sedge, probably six to eight inches tall, thicker leaves, sort of leathery, shiny, glossy leaves. So, you know, blend all these sedge together in a landscape. Your matrix doesn't just have to be one sedge species. Uh, you could have two matrixes, one of Carex albicans, and maybe you throw in some Carex blanda in some open spots. And that really ups the uh, the texture and the contrast. Solomon yeah, so, seal. Okay, well, that's good. You see that? So here's some flowers. Let's see if we can go through these really quickly, because I'm just going to show you pictures of flowers, because this is what people, you know, we want to see pictures of flowers. So shade plants, right? There's Mapella. Can you see that? Uh, it's still Solomon seal. Uh, everybody knows what Solomon seal looks like, but not wonderful underplanted Mapella. Bishop's cap is uh, one of the common names for Mapella defila. All 
I might, you know, I might just get most of the pictures of these plants. I gave you the list of Latin plant names, so if you took pictures of that, uh, we're going to be good. I'd rather get to, um, I'm almost to the end anyway. All right, tell me when you see three pictures of landscapes. We will. <laughs> <laughs> so we skipped the pretty flower pictures, um, but that's what Google's for. Um, hey, that's also what my book is for, right? Somebody's got to sell it. Might as well be me. I make like a dollar off each book. So I need you to uh, go out and purchase a couple hundred copies. <laughs> Perfect. What zone are you planting in? Uh, I, you know, I, I really don't know anymore because I don't plant by zone. Do you want to have my anti-hardiness zone rant? Yes. <laughs> so USD hardiness zones, um, that's one small piece of the puzzle. Uh, just planting by hardiness zone is not enough. I mean, there's, there's, there's heat maps. There's Anyway, in my book, Prairie App, I, I go through the methodology of why we need to get away from USD hardiness zones and instead, instead look at ecoregion maps. So the USD also has, or the EPA has, um, something called ecoregion maps, uh, which, which shows you know your local area, what plants are native to you. Gardening by zip code is even more accurate. You go to like websites like Audubon Society or Pollinator Partnership and you type in your zip code and your native plant finder, that's going to be more accurate about what's going to grow and be native uh, to your landscape. So ecoregions gives us a lot more information. It's a lot more in tune with the local, local environment. I mean, zone six in Virginia is not the same as zone six in Kansas City. All right, complete, I mean, not a completely different plant palette, but a totally different environment. So the plants you're probably gonna be using are different, even if you have some of the same native plant species. Like, I mean, out here in Eastern Nebraska, I share a ton of the same native plants as you guys. So I'm not worried about recommendations so much, but I know you also have different weather patterns. You have different climate. So how you're planting, how you're gardening, what plants you are ultimately using is going to be uh, different. Can you see more layers even in sun? No, we still we still see Solomon Seal. It's really beautiful. All right. Oh, okay. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm almost done anyway. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so when you it. when you have a when you have a full sun landscape and, and you have plants that are maybe two or three feet tall and they're casting a little bit of shade in some areas, go ahead and put in some part sun or even full shade plants plants underneath there if you have some open soil, some bare spots in, in, in your wood mulch or something. Uh, those those part sun and shade plants will probably be perfectly happy underneath the part shade or full shade of taller plants around them. We want to build these layers because these layers are more, uh, they're more dynamic, uh, they're more stable for thinking about climate resilience, um, thinking about weather extremes, right? And of course, the big one is, is habitat for wildlife. We want more layers, we want more plant diversity. And you can squeeze in a lot of plant diversity in that ground cover layer without it looking messy or crazy because most people don't see the plants at the ground cover layer. They see that taller seasonal theme layer uh, that's two, three, four feet tall with, with all the showy, the showiest flowers blooming uh, throughout spring, uh, spring through fall. So we see, well, I was gonna, we see two images yeah. of your books. All right, get my books. All right. Uh, <laughs> God, such a shill. Okay. Well, Rick's going to tell you the same thing when he talks to you all. All right. All right. It switched to a, you in a great t-shirt. Oh, yeah, it's a great t-shirt. Remember, guys, I stand in solidarity with you. I mean, so I stand in solidago with you. I, I'm, I'm here with you. There's so many fantastic resources uh, at my website. I've tried to make it a one-stop shop um, for everything. I have 18 online classes, 15 pocket guides, all kinds of garden planners. You can take a workshop with me, 300-plus free articles and all that stuff, and I'm all over social media. So let's ask some questions, and maybe this screen will pop up the last slide. It, we, we see it. We see your website and um, all of that fun stuff. So excellent. Thank you okay. so much. And so I'm going to now walk around, and we'll do some Q&A. Are these particular slides on your website? Um, there is a longer version of this presentation. It's it, it's it's an on, one of my online classes, and I think it's called Shade Gardening or something like that, or Why Shade Gardening Kicks Butt. I don't know. That would be a good title, um, but it is offered as an online class. Um, but it's not free. You'd have to purchase it. But that's a that's a longer version of this talk. Thank you. Do the sedges 
outgrow the forbs that you put in? I mean, you've got them all so closely mm. spaced, and I'm wondering if like, yes. when you put in new ones, do you pull out the sedges? Oh, gosh, no. Up. Heavens, no. <laughs> oh, we want it. We want it thick. We want it dense. We want it lush. That's, that's, that's the point of doing all this. Uh, no, sedges are not going to uh, uh, outcompete flowers, especially flowers that are the same height or taller. Um, even shorter things. Well, geranium maculatum is pretty big, wild geranium. I'm not worried about that. No, I have never seen an instance of sedge outcompeting uh, of the flowers. Um, but and, and there's also there's also I mean if you want to go really deep into this you can think about about roots as well because sedge have fibrous root zones so you could pick plants that have more like tap roots or have uh, corms or bulbs or something like that so they're not competing at the same level underground but you don't really have to get into that because sedges aren't that out uh, they're not competing that much. Hi, thank you again. I didn't catch the name of the site to buy plug trays. Can you repeat that a little slower? Yes, Azel Native Plants, I-Z-E-L. I'm gonna have to start asking them for kickbacks, to be honest. I mean, I just, I, I just love them. Uh, but, so uh, here's yeah. a sedge question. Um, do you have any luck with expensive, even if you buy plugs? Yes, yes, they can get expensive. You know, I, I, I much prefer gardening by plugs, even if that means I've got to save up money for a year or two. And my experience seeding shade landscapes is, is it is a lot trickier um, than, than seeding a sun landscape. Uh, and a lot of these sedge species are also tricky coming from seed. I have a local grower here who does native plants and they only grow one or two species of sedge um, because they're easier to grow from seed and those are full sun species. So I'm not even going to recommend them to you. They're very, they also have to be very aggressive sedge species. Uh, so I probably, you probably wouldn't want to do those in a small urban landscape anyway, a um, lot or something. So I, I would just advise, yes, I know, I know cost is always a consideration. I would just strongly urge and yeah, get the guaranteed result via plugs if you at all possibly can. So these so-called ground covers like Vinca and Pack of Sandra and those things, if you want to transform your landscape into a shade, one that's you're recommending. Yeah, that's, so on. That yeah, thing? that's like, that, I think that goes under the, uh, that goes under the creeping Charlie category where you want to get, you, you really want to eradicate those species before you start planting. You're just going to be saving yourself uh, a world of hurt. Um, if you can eradicate those species before. And we've done, again, we've tried everything on a lot of these species you mentioned. It's just, it's just like do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a heck of a lot of hand pulling. And it's tedious and annoying. And um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How much should I be concerned about planting under walnut trees? No, actually, uh, just planted underneath walnut trees a year or two ago for a client using almost, I mean, a ton of the species I shared with you today. So I don't think that's going to be an issue for you. That was a good one. A lot of people asked that question too. Thank you. I have a white pine patch. I've had plenty of um, columbines there and may apple. And in the past three years, they have disappeared. I've got fewer and fewer and fewer instead of multiplying. I have no idea where that would be. You're going to want to talk to a, one of your local experts, native plant designers, have them come out and evaluate your site for you. Um, it could just also be, you know, I think about wild columbine, they just don't live that long. Um, they have to self sow. That's what they've evolved to do. So, but why, why, you know, if you have open soil, um, and the seed is hitting that open soil. I don't know why they wouldn't be germinating, but yeah, you need to talk to somebody local for that. It's been best advice. How, how do you feel about trying plants from a more southerly hardiness zone or ecological zone to see how it would do in your garden, especially in response to climate change? I know that's called assisted migration. Yeah, I have I have very very complex feelings about that. Some, some based in scientific studies and some just based on pure ideology. Um, I would just love it if we'd stop burning fossil fuels. I mean, we wouldn't have to worry about all this other stuff. So I, that's, that's the big thing. Um, 
But I have colleagues who are all into assisted migration and planning for the future. I'm just like, what magic eight ball are you using that you can predict what's going to do well? And, and you know, we, we, are, we already so dominate the landscape that for me, ideologically, philosophically, it, it just opens up another can of worms that I, I feel like we have to stop dominating so, so much. But I don't know, there might, become a, there might come a time where we actually have to have to do more of that. But um, yeah, it is such a complex topic. I've got about 25 book recommendations if you'd like them. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, okay, hold on, let me. Uh-huh. Hi, Benjamin. Would you um, have any recommendations for um, some native shrubs that would form a thicket so you can not see your neighbors anymore? <laughs> <laughs> so you could not, what are, are they suntanning naked? Uh. I just don't like people. I'm. I'm a... I know. I'm with you. I don't like people either. Um, fences, good fences make good neighbors, right? Um, you know, when I'm, I don't know how wide I went. I went to my understory in Edgewoodies. I don't know if that's up on the screen. Um, yes, it is. Okay, so here's the suggestion. I don't know how wide your proposed hedgerow is. That's what I'm. That's what I'm imagining here. If I was. Uh, if I if I if I knew I had plenty of room, I would create a hedgerow with uh, trees in the back that are going to be 20, 20 or thirty feet tall, and then I bring in some tall shrubs in front of them that are going to get ten feet tall, and then I bring in short shrubs or or whatnot that are a couple of feet tall, and then and then you have which is fantastic habitat by the way if you have the space to do an actual tiered hedgerow with a lot of diversity of structure and plant species. Um, but you could try looking at some of the plants on this screen and see if they would work for the site conditions that you have. Also, you could just build a really, really tall fence. I'm sure they wouldn't be offended <laughs> at all if you, you know, built a 20 foot tall fence. Yeah. Hello. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for conifers for understory plants or either broadleaf evergreen. I mean, I have really mature thick trees all the way around the perimeter of my backyard and it takes up most of the space of the backyard except for one little sunny space in the middle. And I've had trouble with conifers surviving there. I mean, I, I know most of them are sun lovers and other than yews, I can't think of much else to put under there. <laughs> Yeah, that, I can't think of anything either, um, in part because conifers are out of my wheelhouse just because we don't use very many out here um, because it's the Great Plains. And so it's kind of limited to things like red cedar, but that's pretty much an invasive native species out here. It's better for you guys, but that's a full sun plant. Now, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have any, any ideas for you. That's a, that is a really tough one. Thank you, Benjamin. We have an online question that is, what is the shortest or lowest growing carex? Oh, yes, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, it's one of my favorite sets. Oh my God, I'm just, I'm just bubbling up inside with that question. Uh, carex abernia, E-B-U-R-N-E-A. It's called, I don't know what one of the common names is. I can't remember, ivory sedge maybe? But it looks, it looks exactly like a troll doll who has been buried up to its scalp. <laughs> so all you see is the hair and you just see this fine little tuft of, of, of sedge and it slowly grows sedge and it slowly grows. And we're talking, yeah, just a couple of inches tall. It sort of, it sort of mats the ground. Um, sometimes it's flat, sometimes it's nice and poofy. It just sort of depends on the time of year. The Carex abernia, E-B-U-R-N-E-A. And is that also 12 inches on center or is it a smaller diameter so you would do it more like six inches? You know, if, if you are looking just to cover the ground and make sort of a sedge lawn, um, yeah, you probably want to do that one closer, six or eight inches, and just go bananas with it. Um, but again, let, let me let me throw in a, a little wrench in there. Um, when I say sedge lawn, right, you can't you can't like play soccer on it or something. Sedge don't like to be walked on and run on too much, like a normal traditional lawn. Um, occasional walking is fine. Um, but if you just have a spot where it's like nothing is growing, you want a green cover. You're only going to walk out there like once or twice a week. And, Yes, veg is it, man. All these species are it. Thank you. Hold on, I'm walking to another question. 
Okay. Getting my second. It seems to me that many of the plants you're recommending, especially the spring ephemerals, are ones that do really well in acidic soils. And I appreciate your comments about not amending the soil, kind of, you know, work with what you have. Um, but Columbus is alkaline. So uh -huh. is that going to... So is, yeah. Uh, going to leave a lot of these out? Nope. Uh, um, actually, I'm using... I am gardening in alkaline clay soil with 99% of my clients, and I'm using these species in those soil, soil conditions. Some of the plants on those lists, like when I gave you that, that list of 30 species or something yeah some of those might prefer uh, more acidic uh, looser loam soil but you're going to have to research that but so much of what i've given you today i am using in clay alkaline soil um, clay loam straight clay and uh, they're doing fine uh, and especially sedges sedges could take almost anything you can throw at them especially the ones i showed you here today all right any other questions well, if you could all join me in a round of applause. Benjamin, thank you so much. Thank you for joining me, guys. I sure appreciate the opportunity to uh, travel to Ohio, at least virtually again. And, and thank you for your patience during the technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, yeah, whatever. Life happens. <laughs> all right, thank you. And thank I hope to see everyone in March. <laughs>